So I'd like to welcome in South Carolina Senate candidate, Jamie Harrison. Mr. Harrison, I know you are a very busy man, so I do appreciate you taking the time out of your day to talk. Of course, of course. It's good seeing you. Thank you for having me on. So I know you've been campaigning for a while now on all different platforms from The Breakfast Club to MSNBC. Um, I'd really, really love to talk about some of the issues about that may apply to the younger generation, say my age group that may be in college now or recently graduated. Um, I think one of the biggest issues a lot of us have right now is college itself and its costs. Um, before I talk about possible solutions, or you talk about possible solutions, I would love to know why you think we got into this mess, say 20 years ago to now, when you applied to college, what has transpired that has made the price skyrocket? Well, I think, you know, right when I started, uh, uh, when I started college, that's when we start to see the, the beginning of the astronomical price tags on uh, college tuition. Um, and, and what we have, what we have seen is that it's been like a rock rolling down a hill. It, it's just been picking up more speed and more speed. Um, and the debt has gotten larger and larger. Right now, we have a $1.6 trillion problem as it relates to student loan debt. Uh, when I graduated from uh, law school, I, I ended up having $160,000 of student loan debt. And my wife has $90,000 of debt. So together, $250,000. But there are young people right now here in South Carolina who are graduating with that amount of debt by themselves. Uh, and that's not sustainable. We got to address this issue and we've got to uh, hit it hard. Uh, one of the things that we have seen in South Carolina over the course of the past few, uh, past few years is that the state government has started uh, providing less and less funding to our public universities and colleges here in South Carolina. Um, and, you know, and I saw it about 15 years ago that the, the budget for Carolina, the budget for Clemson and uh, South Carolina State and all, all they, they relatively were decreasing and were not increasing at the rate of inflation as it relates to the amount of money that the state was given. And so that forced the universities, because they wanted to continue the quality of education that they were providing, to increase the, 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 the tuition that they would pass along to their students. And that meant larger student loan debt uh, that the students were required. I believe that it's incumbent upon the state and the federal government to help take some of that burden off of the colleges and universities in, the, in this country. And the real burden is, is on the back of young people. They should not have to be saddled with hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt just when they're starting off uh, th their livelihoods at this point in time. Because, again, it's not sustainable. Um, that's not to say that, uh, you know, I know that some folks want to just completely waive all debt, but that that isn't sustainable, too, because in essence, if you don't address the problem of the rising cost of tuition, then you're just kicking the ball down the down the field uh, for the next generation to have to deal with. And so uh, I think it's going to take a lot of us to be creative, to sit in a room, figure out how we can get more resources to our uh, public colleges and universities so that we can decrease dramatically what those tuition costs are being passed along to uh, to young people. Um, so similar to everything going on in the world right now, they've kind of been intertwined with the pandemic and so have the costs of college and college itself. Um, I wrote a piece about a, a week ago where I said money itself is nothing more than a medium to determine the value of a service. Um, and a lot of these schools are going online. Like I'm at South Carolina, a lot of my classes right now are going online, not all. Um, but what would you say to these schools that are offering online courses like Clemson or South Carolina while still going on campus, or not, not on campus, but are still offering the same amount of tuition while going online? Yeah, well, you know, part of the, the challenge that we, we have, and I think that colleges and universities is that even despite going on online, some of the costs that they have in terms of, you know, the building maintenance, the electricity, some of those things just don't change, regardless of their people in the building or not. Uh, and, you know, some of those costs are reduced, but many of them aren't. And they still have to keep the folks on, on payroll um, or otherwise they're going to have to dramatically reduce that. And so, you know, it's, you know, there's always a ripple effect depending on what happens. Uh, and it will have an impact on the economy one way or the other. I think it's important for all of these institutions to find ways to cut costs as much as possible and pass along those cuts 
uh, in terms of tuition decreases to the students because we know that burden really falls on the student body. But at the same time, I think it's important for all of us to understand is that there's certain uh, costs that just don't change uh, regardless if somebody's on campus or, or, or learning online. Uh, you know, salaries for professors don't change uh, regardless if the students are in their classrooms or not. Um, you know, the administration, the, the admissions office, all of that, they have to continue to do that because there's going to be one day in which we aren't online. And so they got to still bill for those type of things. But like I said, in those areas where they can have some cost savings, they need to figure out how they can pass along some of those cost savings onto the students. I think that's really important. Um, so I return to campus in a few weeks. Um, what are your thoughts on students returning to campus at the current state of South Carolina and all these other places around the country? Well, you know, my North Star has always been on the, the health and safety of our people. Uh, the greatest asset that we have as a nation aren't the corporations, they aren't the businesses, they aren't the institutions. It's the people that, that actually work in them or are educated in them. Uh, and participate in them. And so I think for all of these uh, institutions, my wife's a professor at the University of South Carolina as well, uh, it is to make sure that the students, the faculty, the staff are all safe and that they're taking the measures in order to ensure that. That's number one. And that's really, really important. And if they can't say that they can do all that they need to do in order to do that, then it probably means then they should probably not be in person at this point in time until they can do those things to, to make sure that those students, the staff, and the faculty are all safe and sound. Uh, we all desperately want to get back to normal. I know I definitely want to. Uh, you know, I have two young kids, and uh, my, my oldest son is ready to go back to school. My wife and I are ready to get back to some normalcy to go to the places that we normally go to, the restaurants, and just – just kind of get back to feeling like, wow, things are back to normal. Um, but we, we aren't there yet. And I, I believe the way that we get there, however, is that we have to have a mass mandate here in South Carolina. We have to see a precipitous drop in the number of coronavirus cases um, uh, in the state. And what we, what we have seen since March, when we first closed down uh, schools and universities, shut down and, and businesses shut down, we have seen our numbers increase rather than decrease. And that means that our leadership on the statewide level, and I've called for a statewide mandate, and even if it's on a temporary basis, let's do what we can do so that we can get back to normal, so that people can go back to work, kids can go back, and students can go back to school, uh, and, and, uh, and we can all move forward. Because I think we all want to do that. But in order to do that, Without a vaccine at this point in time, the only control that we have is social distancing and wearing masks. Those are the only two proven things right now that we have we have seen a demonstration that they reduce uh, the number of uh, uh, how the virus is spreading. Um, so I have no idea what's going to happen in November. I know polls say this or that, but I have no idea. What I do predict is going to happen afterwards is whoever has the majority, the minority, is going to filibuster or stall any major legislation until the midterms. Um, so my question is, how do we have, how do we get to a system that actually gets progress and solutions and legislation? And because I kind of feel when these politicians are fighting each other on Twitter um, for retweets, I feel like it's the citizens that are the ones getting hurt. So how do we end the divideness? Well, you know, there are a lot of, um, I think institutional things that need to happen in order to bring down the temperature in Washington, D.C. I also think we need to start to get some even-minded people in Washington, D.C., not folks that are hyper-partisan in, in either direction. People who are looking at uh, making progress and, and, um, and, and getting things done. And, you know, Lindsey Graham used to be that type of person. That's why I used to have so much admiration and respect for Lindsey. But he's a very different guy right now. You know, when I was the chair of the South Carolina Democratic Party, one of my best friends uh, here in South Carolina was the Republican chair of the state party, Matt Moore. Matt and I even taught, team taught a class together at the University of South Carolina a few years ago where we taught uh, a course on political parties. Uh, and, and, and it's about how I look at the world. In the end, I don't believe, you know, I don't hate the other side. I don't hate 
folks because they have different political opinions to me. The way that I look at it is, yes, the, the, the routes that we take may be different, but the destination should be the same. It, it should be how can we make South Carolina a better place for all of us, for all of our kids, all the people that we love, regardless of what we look like, how we love, who we love, uh, you know, who we worship. That should be our North Star uh, as public servants, because it's about serving the public and moving forward. And so when I get to Washington, D.C. as a United States senator from South Carolina, I'm going to be looking to build bridges with the other side to figure out how we can get progress done. How can we get uh, infrastructure in South Carolina? How can we make sure that the communities that don't have broadband have broadband? How do we fix the roads and the bridges and the potholes in South Carolina? Those things aren't Democratic or Republican problems. Those are all of our problems. You know, how can our school systems be better? How do we address the student loan crisis? How do we deal with climate change? Those are things that are necessary for us to deal with. We cannot kick that can down the road any longer because if we do, things will fall apart. So I'll be looking for partnerships across the aisle to get things done. I know folks who are thinking about getting rid of the filibuster and all those types of things, but I don't think we need to do things that I, I believe, in essence, um, create even more uh, animosity. Let's figure out how we just talk to each other and work with each other to get things done for the American people. So I know you are a very busy man, so I'm gonna let you go, but I do have two more quick questions. Uh, I saw on your, tw on your Twitter bio, you are a, a big Bojangles fan. I would love to know your go-to order, and I think I know the answer to this one, but whenever they get back on the field, who are you taking, Clemson or South Carolina? Oh man, on, the, on that one is Carolina, of course. Um, it, it's a no-brainer for me. Uh, as it relates to, uh, yeah, I love so much at Bojangles. <laughs> it all depends on what time of the day it is. Uh, those blueberry biscuits, I you know, every time I go by there, you know, it's you hear like a little voice in your hair, like in your head, like stop, Jamie, you really want one? You or, or the cinnamon biscuits, like oh, Jamie, it's so good, you really need to get one. And then I love the tenders. I, I mean, I, I love tenders and fries, and so uh, I stop the chicken supremes. And so I'll stop by and get some of those as well. Um, but I also like, like, uh, you know, the sausage, egg and cheese biscuits. I like the country ham and egg biscuit. Uh, it all depends on the mood of the day, but you can't go wrong with Bojangles. <laughs> Mr. Harrison, thank you so much. And I wish you the best of luck over the next few months. Thank you, man. You take care of yourself and be safe.